Good morning, Living Water Church. It is good to see you. Uh, we look forward to being together in person and hope you are well. Uh, let's sing together. Sing of the greatness of God. There is no one like our God. Amen. There is no one like our God. And we want to sing uh, from something deep within our soul. I think we need it. And again, I just I encourage you to just find that sweet spot, that time with the Lord where you can just lay down your cares and lay down your concerns and just focus on him. So if it takes you the whole first song, then just focus on the lyrics. But join in, sing out loud when you can, when you're ready, and just embrace uh, the power of worship and the reality of just being near our Savior in that experience. So let's sing together.
So good morning, Living Water Church, or whenever you might be watching this. This happens to be our first week of hybrid services. In other words, we have an outdoor service taking place on Sunday mornings now, as well as an online digital service for those who wish to stay at home. And we want to affirm both groups in whichever way they want to receive the service um, in the weeks to come. But with that being said, I do want to cross over into our message this morning. If you want to press pause on the digital version of this, you can open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28 and going to verse 39. Over the years, I've seen pastors preach this verse again and again and again, and I don't know that I've ever actually preached on it. Um, I've been saving it for a, a rainy day, and uh, hopefully it's not raining right now where you're at, but you get what I mean. This is a sermon text that is very, very good for our time. In fact is, the text, the main text that I want to get across to everyone is, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's important for us as God's people to remember that text. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. As always, I want to give a little bit of a background on this. This is Romans 8. And before that, in, in Romans 7, you're going to notice that Paul is really wrestling through this idea of what does it mean to be the non-regenerate individual? Or perhaps the Christian individual struggling with sin. There's a little bit of an interpretational question there. But either way, the idea is, is that sin degrades us, sin pulls us away from God, and it's a real struggle in our mental life and in our, our, our actual life. So as we walk through that passage, we hear phrases like, the things that I want to do, I do not do, and the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. And he ends the passage very close to wretched man that I am, what shall I do? And then Romans 8 opens up with the great answer to what we shall do. But I want to skip ahead now to Romans 9. This is actually also important for the backdrop of this passage here in Romans 8. It's a passage which any Jewish background believer in the first century church would be really wrestling over the question. And the question has to do with how could God's people, the Jews, who followed him for generations, find themselves now outside of the covenants and the promises. Since, since Jesus has come, they're no longer, a portion of them at least, no longer following the covenants and the promise because they chose not to accept God's Messiah to them, whom God had planned to send for a long, long time. So what of these people, and moreover, the internal question that could be reflected as well on these believers in Rome was, does this affect us at all either? Is there a time that we could find ourselves outside of the covenants and the promises, outside of the will of God? And so Paul wrestles with that, and I highly encourage the read. But that's then what gets us to chapter 8, sort of the bi-directional answer to both chapter 7 and chapter 9, that if you are found in Christ, that if you love Jesus then nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is found in Jesus Christ. That's good news, everybody. It's good news to know that our personal struggle with sin, or perhaps the question about being outside of the covenants and the promises, that if you're found in Jesus, nothing shall separate you from God's love. But let's translate this a little bit more to our modern times. Hard times, we might say. Paul says, in reference to hard times or reference to all things, that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. I think at first glance, we might sort of be shocked by this. Like, really, Paul, all things work together for the good of those who love God? But again, God's ledger or God's books or God's justice isn't borne out in one day alone. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, that was the end of the story. In fact, the story continues to go on. And that's where we learn some of the hardships, even in the, the later passage. Paul mentions things like troubles, difficulties, 
disease, hardships, the sword, persecution, famine, nakedness. The Apostle Paul and numerous of the Christian leaders were well acquainted with hardship back then, well acquainted with difficulty. And so he's not writing this sort of divorced from the world scene. He's not writing this with no senses of how hard life can be. He's writing this with an intimate awareness of how hard life can be. And he still wants everything, everybody to know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I grew up with a, a story that my dad would often tell. It's a story uh, centered in China, in the rural region of China, and not in the modern period either. And this China, this man from China has a son, young son, and so, so he has a small family, and he happens to have a horse. And this horse is helping them to do their farming. This horse is helping them to do their traveling. And this horse has, by and large, lifted them to a quality of life that is considered very good in that region. And one day, somebody leaves the gate open, and the horse gets out and runs away. And the neighbor comes over, sort of feeling bad for his, his friend, and says, I'm sorry to hear that your horse got out. What bad luck. And the owner of the horse in the story says, well, we'll see. So they go their separate ways. A few weeks later, they had left the gate open in case their horse got, hung got hungry and wants to run back into the gate. And so a few weeks later, the horse did come back. And it brought a, a number of other horses, wild horses, with it. And they ran into the gate together. And so the man and his young son could close the gate. And now they own a number of horses. And their, if you will, their standing, their economic well-being, their abilities have just been increased in an incredible way. And the neighbor comes over and says, wow, you have such good luck. This is such great news. I'm so happy for you. And the father and the owner of the horses says, we'll see. Well, later on, as the son grew older and he's working with these horses, one of the horses got a little bit intense with him, pushed him over and crushed his knee with its foot, with its, um, and the, the poor boy's knee would never recover entirely. He would always have a limp from here on out. And the neighbor comes over again and said, I'm sorry to hear your bad luck. I'm sorry to hear about the news from your son. And the father in the story once again says, we'll see. Lo and behold, China decides to go to war and they go around all of the regions, the cities and the rural regions, and they're collecting all of the young men for, for war. And they, of course, go to the neighbor's house and they take his son and they go to the father's house, the one with the horses, and they look at the son and they determine that he isn't fit for battle. He won't be able to walk and march with them with heavy packs on their backs for, for long periods of time. And so they leave him. And of course, at some level, there could have been a level of dishonor and a feeling of, of disrepute. But the neighbor comes over one more time and says, you have such good luck. Your son doesn't have to go onto the battlefield and die. And the father, in typical phrases, says, we'll see. You see, the point of that story is it's not always easy to see how one given hardship is to produce something else later on, or one given benefit is to produce something else later on. And God's perspective, of course, isn't closed in a day. And so God really can eventually bring all things together once again for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But this moves us away, I want to move us away from these external circumstances of hardship, trouble, famine, destruction, and I want to move to internal circumstances. Circumstances like guilt, shame, and regret. These sort of categories really are what it means to be human. If you're self-aware, likely you've had shame likely you've had guilt, and the older you get, likely you've experienced regret as well. And these are sort of those 
internal, introspective things. There's an external component to them as well. Sometimes when we talk about other cultures, especially in the history books, there's a, a, a number of discussions about Eastern cultures, which tend to be more shame-based cultures. The way they've set their societies up are, are ways that they can accrue shame depending upon the circumstances that happen, or honor as well, honor shame. But in the Western cultures, they typically uh, say that these cultures are more guilt-based cultures, that the ways they've set up their societies it can force guilt or perhaps the opposite feeling as well. And so clearly, though, I don't think that these are 100% accurate uh, in, in the sense of like totally explaining any one given culture. In fact is, I think if one is experiencing shame, they could often experience guilt as well. But I want to point us to Adam and Eve, these great examples of what it means to be human. And sometimes we only focus on what happens um, in their decisions and their activity before the fall. But even just prior to the fall, they're tempted away towards this fruit by a hostile individual. And these epitome examples of what it means to be human, after they have sort of crossed the line, they experience guilt. I mean, think of, think of when Adam and Eve start to blame one another. They say, oh, well, she made me do it, or the serpent made me do it. Sometimes, not always, but when blaming starts to take place, but again, this is not always. There's adequate blaming that is, that is real in order to tell the truth. But sometimes when you see somebody who has, is guilty of something and they begin the blaming process, it could be an indicator of guilt and them trying to avoid it. But also we see shame. We see that they're now aware of their nakedness in this early picture of humanity. And they begin to cover up because they're in shame for what's taken place. And so you see guilt and you see shame in these early examples of what it means to be human. And I want to argue that to have guilt and to have shame and even regret is part of what it means to be human. Now, I don't think that we have to stop there. I don't think that those determine us, but I just find them to be the limits of the human experience that we have. The Bible pictures things like shame and guilt can come about when we've sinned and we know we're at odds in a relationship with God. But there are also other circumstances that guilt or shame can sort of rear their heads. Sometimes uh, when we Christians, we go on in to an, another, say, culture or something, or even sometimes within our own sort of like Wisconsin culture, we find that there are some things that are considered shameful that God himself doesn't consider shameful. There are some things that people accrue guilt for in their minds that God himself did not say was sinful. And therefore, in our own culture and as, as Christian uh, missionaries go into other cultures, we always want to begin to become self-aware of those things that are real indicators of the wrong we've done or perhaps are false indicators of wrong we have not done. And so what I want us to just sort of see with this is the human element, but also the difficulty that comes upon our lives when we have guilt or shame. If you have guilt or shame and you've sinned, you know you've broken one of the commandments, you know you haven't loved God with your whole heart or something like that, go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. That would be an adequate indicator. But if you haven't sinned and you're experiencing shame or guilt, then perhaps it's an opportunity to re-examine what was really going on there. Now, I want to come back to this in just a little bit. But the book of Romans is, especially chapter 9, 10, and 11, a look at the nation of Israel and how God can still be faithful to his people through their faith, despite some individuals choosing not to walk on into the covenants of the promise. Now, imagine yourself asking the question, Am I in Christ? Am I separated from the Lord based upon something that I have done? And the Apostle Paul says in 8 that, No, nothing shall separate you 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're in Christ, there isn't anything that can separate you from him. But then we kind of move on into the other area where what Paul highlights. And Paul highlights sin. And Paul highlights the, the wrestling match of the self. And will we follow God's way or will we follow another way? Our carnal nature, we might call it. And this, of course, is also the difficult side of sort of the biblical picture of how do we come to salvation, wrestling through that and then coming to grips with what God has done in salvation. Again, chapter 7 into chapter 8 is a glorious transition in the book of Romans. But then one last thing, again, we get to the hardships that I've already kind of mentioned. Hardships, guilt, shame, all of them are valid in their own expression. But, and this is what I really want you to get out of today's message, that sometimes the hardships that we experience and the difficulties that we experience in life can kind of come back around or play a game in our emotions and our mental life that cause us to ask questions about our relationship with God. And I want to challenge you to say that if again, once, if, if, if you're not in sin per se, then it would be important for us to consider the other half of the equation of salvation. You see, as human beings in our relationship with God, we're like one or one out of a thousand in reference to who has the greater portion of the equation. God's work is the larger portion of the equation. Now, once in a while, Christians sometimes say that, that everything, the onus is always on God. And of course, salvation offered is on God. But there is the element of our free will and us choosing to follow after God and to be in Christ. So maybe it's 10 compared to a million or 100 compared to a billion. Whatever ratio we want to understand it, there is human responsibility in reference to our relationship with God. But in the middle of hardship and in the middle of guilt and shame, especially those sorts of all those circumstances working together, it can cause us to internally question how, what is our relationship with God and, and how do we determine that? And today's message, I want to encourage you to remember that the larger part of the equation of our relationship with God is God himself and his activity. And when we look to that larger part of the equation, through the middle of our hardship, through the middle of our guilt, through the middle of our shame, sometimes all those misdirecting our thoughts into the wrong sorts of pathways, I think God wants to tell us, and the Apostle Paul affirmed the Roman Christians in this respect as well, nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's what we need to reflect on the rest of this week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, if any who are out there taking part in today's message are full of guilt or full of shame, especially in a misdirected way, we pray, God, that they would turn that over to you or they're just in hardship and they're reflecting on their relationship with you. I pray that they would hear loudly and they would hear that now word in their life. Nothing shall separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We pray, God, that your word would be mighty in their life as a reminder that they are yours because they're in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good Sunday, everyone.